Hey, it's James here. Welcome to part two of this personal branding mini series, if you like. Now, if you didn't see part one, where we talked about developing a concept, you can click on the link on your screen now. That'll take you back to part one. I recommend watching that before we embark on part two. In this video, we're going to be learning all about visual identity. Why is it important to create a unique visual identity that's kind of an extension of your personality? And also, why it's important to create something that's unique and going to stand out in the crowd? Because you don't want your visual brand to look like everyone else's ultimately. We're going to be talking about how to find a designer to work with, how to actually set them a brief and kind of describe exactly what you want, and then also how you can refine your personal brand to kind of achieve the look and feel that you want. Ultimately, it's very important that you have consistency across everything you do, whether that's creating video content like this, creating you know written content, perhaps PDF reports or presentations, or if you're just posting social media posts as well. I think it's really important that your visual identity is uniform and stands out because you need to make sure that you're breaking through the noise. Now, hopefully, in this video, we're going to give you some tips on exactly how to do that. All right, so what I wanted to do is in this video show you the kind of creative process and how my personal brand evolved and as I was working with uh, Studio Squid, Mark Dormand, who's a great designer that I've worked with on previous occasion with another brand that I had. So I thought, let's go with him again. You know, I've worked with various different designers over the years, both agencies, big and small. The process is always collaborative. You generally have to make sure that you've got a good open line of communication. And what I wanted to do as well after this screen share video is actually interview Mark and really get his take on what a personal brand is and get some tips and pointers if you're thinking about designing your personal brand and specifically working with a third party designer which I recommend ultimately you get something that's unique and you know you get something that can be applied in so many different ways so let's dive in and I'll, I'll take a look so this was the sort of first draft of my personal brand if you like this is from like the end of last year a bit about the brief you know again if you work with the designer they should be sending you PDFs like this not just sending you random images but they should really be like pitching their work to you a good designer will come back with collateral like this so I had a logo already which was designed the year before which I was kind of happy with and initially I wanted to brand my podcast create reach inspire and I was kind of running with that with my personal brand in the end I've ended up sort of ditching that a bit and moving just towards James Mulvaney in general but I still use the same visual styles we actually had a cool office mural drawn by a local artist on the wall so he took my logo and he added these kind of cool funky shapes around the edge of it like circles squares geometric triangles so I kind of sat down with Mark and I said look let's create something based on this the artist took the inspiration from this Japanese sort of uh, drawing which is I think like quite old but you know he kind of used that as his kind of inspiration so anyway we got the logo and as you can see here we've got some suggestions for different color palettes now this is great I wasn't keen on this I kind of felt like these colors were a little bit washed out I wanted something a bit more zappy a bit more neon you know likewise got an alternative set of color but I think color is always a great place to start when you're working with a designer also a bunch of typography options you know these are basically different font recommendations that might look different might stand out again that was part of the brief that I set mark I wanted something that going to stand out and not necessarily just be the same as what everyone else has got okay so again some applications of how the content could look uh really really basic stuff you know just taking the logo that i already had and kind of working it in with some new colors and some different ideas now i'll be honest with you this first um draft i wasn't really that happy with i didn't think this really reflected me as a person and overall i just you know it just didn't sit right and i think obviously your personal brand is a personal thing isn't it it's for you so it's really got to be an extension of your personality so here's some other suggestions and different kind of visual language etc so we kind of gave him some feedback based on this first branding and again you know maybe just sort of like moved on from there as you can see loads and loads of stuff here so different different options okay so what we want to do is just show you some some other concepts that Mark then came back with and um, as you can see the colors are a little bit more zippy but you know we've got some really weird fonts here I wasn't really keen on these fonts so I said we need to sort of reiterate them all right so then we kind of got some another revision back and we settled on this color palette which is the one we ended up going with and also then some suggestions for typography now what I really like about working with Mark is he didn't just kind of come back with a generic concept you know with Laura and Ipsum lots of 
Master Design is just slinging Lorem Ipsum just because it's easy and quick. But we actually work with some titles of content that we could actually post. So you can actually kind of get an idea of how the content might look. And these are actual photos or clips of videos that we've got as well. Again, different scale content. So we've got sort of square posts, which are great for like Instagram, maybe LinkedIn, and also more like traditional 16 by nine stuff, which could be used as a slideshow. It could be used for video. You know, again, lots of suggestions of typography, plus also these kind of cool background shapes and colors. Once we're happy with this, um, finally what we did was we ended up with um, what you what is called a brand pack or brand guidelines now let me just show you this so this is this is my brand guidelines document which Mark put together which was the sort of sign off stage this is it this is what we're running with um, and this covers various different things so like the logo which we don't tend to really use anymore but it's mainly about the typography and color palette and also how you can use these different kind of geometric shapes in the content that you're creating. Now what's the point of a brand pack or a brand guideline? Well if you work with anyone apart from yourself and actually it's good just for your own personal use to just have that kind of mental reference point which you can always look back to but if you work with any members of your team so for example we have social media managers uh, I work with videographers I work with people creating marketing content you can send them this group this brand guideline pack and they should have a good idea of how the brand could be applied to different types of content along with looking at the um, you know, applications as I just showed you so they've got some good ideas so we've got the color palette laid out really clearly here again it's important to ask for this from your designer they need to create a brand pack which has the color palette different hex codes so you can easily apply them to different things you create yourself you can just copy and paste this into Photoshop or Canva or a website design tool that you're using to make sure that the colors are all exactly matched across different uh, platforms and different content again some examples of how different color combinations could be used plus typography you know this is really really important what fonts are going to be used for different things so I've got two different heading fonts that we use for content you know to kind of like get through and kind of create that impact that you want hero text it's called um, and also some body copy as well and again we've got different variations of the font different weights etc this should all be specified in your brand pack then also with this brand I have these kind of funky shapes which are used in the background this is really just to create texture and create kind of like a layer of um, interest I guess on our content again how they used some examples here uh, with the fonts and finally which is really really great I've just got this Dropbox link which will take me directly to a folder I can download all of this stuff including you know like the fonts the brand pack plus also lots and lots of illustrator files with the applications that I just showed you before so we can just easily kind of download them again if I'm working with anyone else if I've hired a videographer if I've hired a social media manager I can give them that Dropbox link and they can get everything they need really really good advice um, and a great way of building a brand so what I wanted to do now was interview Mark who I work with on this brand not specifically talking about my brand but really just getting his take on how to design an effective personal brand and also you know just make sure that you're working well with the designer because I ultimately working with designers is a collaborative process you know you need to work from them you need to bounce off each other and you should always go to a designer with an open mind and trust their expertise trust their guidance and be open to them suggesting improvements or suggesting ideas don't just try and be too kind of heavy fisted so allowing them to provide and influence your decisions is always a good idea because ultimately they're a professional designer they're the expert when it comes to design so to some extent I think giving them that freedom and flexibility is really important you know yes you're the client you have your own opinions but sometimes they have better ideas than you and they might understand how color works or how fonts work better than you so remember if you're hiring a designer to respect the fact that they're the expert so without further ado I wanted to cut to a little interview I did with Mark and we'll chat personal branding design okay Mark so welcome along um, we've worked with each other on a couple of occasions in the past uh, firstly let's kick things off what's the difference between designing an identity for a personal brand versus a traditional what you'd imagine to be a company or a startup or a brand yeah um, it's probably one of those cases where I actually let the client have a personal opinion <laughs> everyone has brings their own personality to everything and yeah. uh, when it's a, an organization people have personal likes and dislikes and often some of it is delicately helping them move away from their favorite color and what's appropriate to their audience and yeah. there's an element of that in a personal brand too but obviously with it being a person you know their actual personal uh, preferences do come into play but also 
still being mindful of, of who they're trying to reach and the audience that they're after as well. So, um, so there's a lot of crossover, but it's definitely have a little bit more fun and play a little bit more with it. I think so. Let your personality shine through. Sure, yeah, definitely, definitely. There's so there's so much out there that there's um, trying to be this some sort of corporate robot doesn't do anyone any favor no one's interested in seeing the same old thing so when you sort of a client would approach you and ask to develop work with them on developing a personal brand hmm. what's your approach to that how what advice would you give to someone who's perhaps watching they kind of don't really know where to start because obviously like you say it's a personal thing you want it to kind of reflect your personality but also it, not, it must serve a purpose yeah. and what kind of assets are important to look at in terms of when you're actually creating a visual you know identity or a brand sort of document what are the deliverables in terms of when when someone's approaching design and what do they need to make sure they're looking out for i think the main thing is kind of to relax into it a little bit and not worry about coming to it with a fully formed idea because i think some people i've definitely spoken to a few people who are a little bit concerned they don't have a fully fleshed fully realized idea to present to a designer to uh, mm. to, to then refine and polish so i think it's more about thinking about how you want to be perceived and how you want to come across and kind of like think about the kind of broad strokes really of both who you are and how you come across and present and present because obviously people do have their own personas yeah kind of allow yourself to be guided and kind of I think creating the brief you can go one of two ways with producing a brief for a designer you can either go full detail as much as you can possibly think of which is always welcome because some of that research is part of the process or just keep it really light just kind of focus on how you want to come across who you're trying to reach, who you're trying to connect with, and kind of go from there, really, and let yourself be guided by the designer. Um, and obviously, if you have really strong likes and dislikes, or you have, you know, an arch nemesis out there, you absolutely don't want anything to yeah. do with, then obviously that information is useful. In terms of the assets, the assets from the designer side of things, you want to have the uh, real content to work from, or at least a draft of it, so that you mm -hmm. can put something back in front of someone who, if they're not used to uh, dealing with a designer, it's easy for me to look at a logo or a piece of type or a color palette and go, right, this could go a thousand different ways it's not necessarily easy for someone else to visualize it so when you have some real content some real text some real kind of imagery you can start to sort of like encapsulate that just help someone connect to it and, and get what you're trying to make happen for them in terms of assets and things that will be needed for a personal brand obviously very much depends on how you want to go about it yourself because you know you can have your own brand identity, a little logo device, but you don't have to. What I would say, the main things is like, you know, having some nice typefaces you use, a color palette that you're consistent to. Yeah. Um, and those choices are really important in terms of personality and what energy you give off. And um, I think people tend to be quite used to the idea of color having a lot of um, uh, meaning to it, but people tend to forget that things like type choices actually mm -hmm. Think it's something designers think about but most people otherwise don't and the shape and form of things obviously has a lot sort of the softed rounded sharp edges all of these things mean different things all of those elements are used um as part of the assets down the line so it'd be yeah your color palette your typefaces those things go into the guidelines and the tone of voice as well is quite important which i think is something that's obviously doesn't necessarily come from the designer but is certainly useful to be talked around because that really is reflected visually and kind of helps inform the feel and vibe of everything going forwards as well. I think yeah, I think I agree with that. And, and it's interesting because obviously in part one of this series, we talk very much about forming um, a concept and, you know, basically figuring out what your mission is, like what's the purpose of okay. developing a personal brand? What are you trying to achieve with it? You know, who the customers are you're trying to reach? And also, like, I think you, you may touch on a really important point. Tone of voice is really important because that, again, relays to the sort of people that you're trying to talk to. Talking to an incredibly corporate crowd working in, I don't know, corporate finance or something, you might want to yeah. use a different, different tone of voice to reaching to creatives or people working in the startup world or whatever it might be. And also in terms of um, looking at assets, Obviously, there's you know tons of different platforms out there at the moment. What would you say uh, fo fo uh, is an important thing to focus on? Like, obviously, lots of people watching this and they might be thinking, "Oh, I'm going to be creating videos. I might be creating PDFs, mm. um, static images with quotes on." Um, so all of this sort of needs to be taken into account when you're actually writing a brief for a designer, right? The designer will hopefully ask you all of these things about where it needs to go, how it needs to live, because you know you might want a load of um, printed elements. You might want to have a bunch of, of giveaways. For flyers, posters or whatever, promotional stuff, or you might 
literally everything is 100% digital. Things like Twitter, social media, everything has different elements. And, yeah. and as you say, when you're creating video, how text lives on a video, mm. how you hold an image on a video, whether you want to like specially treat your photography and whether you want to bring in sort of texture or illustration and all of these different things. So there's, there's a lot to consider. There's a lot to think about. But also, again, that can be kind of part of the process. The designer can help you, hopefully, in producing exactly what you need and can give you a kit of parts and bits and guidance on on how to use some of that and obviously also your own experience level is also is important in that in your instance you're, you're very familiar with a lot of creative tools and and yep. things that are out there for a lot of people very much kind of thinking more about what typefaces are very easily accessible what they can mm. get hold of what's appropriate for them to use and yeah i'm working to an appropriate kind of audience as you say is like whether it's, it's if it's something very sort of corporate and and or, or modest it's going to have a very different set of assets to something that wants to be very in your face and energetic and 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 more quirky and more personality and that brings me nicely to the next question which is um how important do you think it is to create something that's unique and breaks through the noise because you know i see a lot of personal brands out there that they haven't really given much consideration to the look and feel of it they're either just using templates or it's just very much just like you know black text with a white background in a generic font that or there's that one font that everyone tends to use on videos every everyone's content starts to look and feel the same do you think it's quite important that you know you have something that stands out as a, as a designer obviously yeah uh, much uh, <laughs> much strong opinion on things being unique and yeah well but definitely because um you know again it comes back to that whole the entire sort of right back to the beginning the tone of voice the who you are the strategy of that the um presenting yourself and making yourself not necessarily just screaming above the noise because there's an awful lot of people all screaming at once all trying to get your attention so it's not yep. necessarily doing something different for different sake but maybe looking at what is out there and seeing you know in, in in the crowd of people you're trying to talk to what is everyone else saying to those people what are they either getting totally wrong that you can right. see really clearly or what would really stand outside and that could be something as simple as everyone uses these three colors so you use three different ones or it can be you know the typography is terrible you spend a bit of energy on that it, it, it can be quite subtle things i do think uniqueness definitely helps because yeah you are trying to step aside from from the people who don't really think about it and don't stop and think and i think even to people who aren't creative and aren't designers it's quite tangible when you notice something that's just pleasing that's just nice uh, you you might not be able to put your finger on exactly why that is, but you can tell good design from bad design, even if you were pushed, you would have no clue as to what the actual difference is. Yeah, so so it's almost like a sort of sub a subconscious realization that your target audience will have when they see something, they think, oh, wow, that looks cool. Or, wow, that looks a bit different. Um, yeah. And also, I think as well, you know, one of the important things for me was the consistency. You know, if you're creating content and it all follows the same vibe in terms of its visual identity, and someone sees your content one week and they might think, oh, that's brilliant. And then they see the content again the next week they'll say the, oh it's that it's that guy because you've got that uniqueness to to what you've got and it's not it's just not the same as everyone else's so i think you know having something that's got a strong identity but also then that you can roll out consistently uh, across mm. different assets different platforms and just kind of create that momentum is really important and finally i just sort of wanted to touch on like design tools obviously there's lots and lots of design tools springing up so i think these are kind of giving these are giving a lot of people ideas that well you know i don't need to hire a designer or i can just use templates what are the sort of pros and cons to using a tool like that in, in, in your in your eyes? I mean, the pros obviously are saving yourself some money because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, commissioning sort of bespoke stuff is, is always more money than people tend to think. It's mm. unfortunately never quite as cheap as, oh, my cousin's got a copy of something they shouldn't have. Yeah, um, yeah. And there are a lot of interesting tools that are out there. I've definitely, it's one of the things that I've noticed a few people when they have been trying to be thrifty. And there's lots of ways to be thrifty. You can work again with a designer to help you be thrifty mm. uh, in terms of creating new assets that you can use in things like Google Docs and Google, um, it's not Sheets, their version of PowerPoint. <laughs> it's got on my head. Google uh, Slides. Yeah. Slides, there we go. Yeah. yeah. Those with a few clients and they are actually surprisingly useful and quite good for a few things. And I know another client that has, has started delving into using Canva. So there are these things out there and they are useful and you can 
do good things with them. The thing that I think is quite difficult for people to grasp, and mm. I've definitely noticed a few people, when you present someone with the assets and elements and uh, sort of like your brand guidelines, like your little PDF of telling you your colors, mm. your typeface, vague sort of instructions on, on uh, how to lay things out nicely and things. I've definitely seen a few people decide that means great, now I'm a designer. <laughs> um, and if you've worked with them closely and you can show them how to do it, it does more often than not look nice, look tidy. But it can, even with the best one in the world, go a little bit sideways quite easily because there is an element of experience of just knowing when something's right and arranging the same elements. So right. if you have elements, you arrange it by a designer, it will look nicer than someone who isn't arranging the same elements, just because that experience, that familiarity is quite hard to pass on. But mm. that's where, you know, if someone commission is commissioned and provides templates, that can really help with that. Yeah. So, so basically what you're saying is there's nothing wrong with using tools like Canva. Don't necessarily um, rely on the, the built in templates. Cause like, you know, I use Canva for bits and bobs and I must admit, you know, it does make things, it's slightly more user friendly than Photoshop, you know, in, in some respects, but obviously it's kind of more limited on what you can and can't do. But I would say for, you know, the, one of the things with a personal brand is about being consistent. So it's about quite often creating assets on a daily basis. So you might be creating, you know, seven different posts, yeah. you know, over the course of a week on one platform and, you know, different size posts on another platform and i think it is good for, for kind of um pumping out content really quickly so what you're saying is you know there's no harm in using tools like that but it's always good to sit down with the designer at the beginning and actually kind of work out that visual identity uh, that the visual direction and potentially actually create some templates specific for specifically yeah. for a platform that you can then go edit yeah. the text really quickly to create content but i have produced some templates for, for clients uh, in in canva a lot yeah. of it not necessarily because as you say the consistency is is very key because mm. the temptation i think when people have things like canva or, or anything with access to lots and lots of typefaces like oh, great i can use a different typeface <laughs> right okay. every time it's like yeah. three different fonts and typefaces and you unfortunately kind of have to fight that urge there's nothing wrong with like establishing a good few because we've got we've got a few a uh, few going for you but ultimately mm. it's still trying to decide on those few and stick to them just for that bit of consistency just on fonts there how what would you suggest like uh so for, for my personal brand we, we've got kind of two different heading fonts which can be used kind of either together or sort of different you know separately and they work pretty nicely we also have a, a like a body font which we don't tend i've found that we actually doesn't seem that we use that very much at all <laughs> but um you know is it is three fonts kind of a good good guide yeah i mean i think that gives you a lot of flexibility and, and playfulness i mean the thing is you can i've done i've done other brands where i've given them one font <laughs> that's yeah. it so that's, your, that's your one typeface and if you use that really nicely and minimally and concisely and, 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 and very precisely that mm. can look very elegant and lovely however if it's a personal brand you probably want something a bit more flexible and a bit more yeah. fun so you want to have a couple in there I definitely say you know f feel free to have a couple of really interesting fun ones because we've got essentially yeah, the headline ones and we've got the, the very safe serviceable if you really want to put quite a lot of text on something yeah, like then a word document or something, doing, yeah. then it's good to have something consistent that you have mm for those eventualities so that you're not left scrabbling for for something but yeah i would keep it to, to two to three at, at, at the most really okay. there's always rules you can break but definitely and i, I think what's quite interesting about quite a lot of fonts that are available now is they come in so many different variations you know so you have like extra bold and bold and you know so actually sometimes one font in a particular style looks completely different to it to in a different way does that make sense definitely no i think i think that's something actually is quite interesting and probably something that people who don't know fonts and typefaces probably are really not aware of at all um yeah. why would you it's, it's very, quite niche knowledge um but when you say a typeface you kind of you mean kind of like it's referred to generally as a family um of mm. different typefaces so what you tend to think of is you think well you've got regular you've got bold you've got italic you've got bold italic those are the things everyone knows you have mm. but in a big typeface that's one typeface you might have 20 yeah. which is a variety of, of width thicknesses whether they're extended and stretched and thin and condensed and yep. so yeah no absolutely so you can have a lot of consistency and a lot of fun with those sorts of font families that are that they all they're all designed to work together so you can have a lot of variety without losing the will to live because it's the same thing over and over <laughs> <laughs> okay also quickly on fonts how about um purchasing fonts do you think it's a good idea to buy fonts just to be original because obviously there are certain fonts that you know included with every single operating system and they're kind of done to death not very unique and i think as, especially um perhaps a lot of people going to personal brand don't realize that there is this 
huge amount of like they call them foundries don't they creating these bespoke fonts oh, so what's, what's your opinion on that is it is it worthwhile investing in it in a font that's perhaps a little bit rarer yeah i think it depends how pivotal it's going to be to your personal brand because mm -hmm. uh, if you have a personal brand that for example does away with having a logo you, you are your personal brand so it's your face yeah. uh, it's what you say and you don't need a logo for, to go with that so it might be you just want like a really beautiful typeface that mm -hmm. not many will have in which case yes but they and they range massively in price oh yeah uh, there are amazing resources out of that i definitely as you mentioned it i just have to sort of in passing refer to it which is that the fonts that come with your your operating system tend to be not brilliant they're, yeah. they're everywhere and, and and they go everywhere and and that's fine but ultimately there are some really great ones you can buy but there's also things like um google fonts has an amazing library and not all of them are great but there are some lovely uh, mm. lovely typefaces in there and the positives of those is they also work with everything google so again going back to creating assets in things like google docs and google slides you have those typefaces to hand and again they can be used uh, very easily on websites and things yeah um, if you do have a website alongside of it so yeah so i mean definitely it's worth it's worth investing it if you can afford to it there are yeah. three ways around it but definitely i would say you know it's an important part of of a personal brand is is that visual language yeah and it's, it's something i think a lot of people completely overlook really so um why well, I, I just had a good question but it's left me and it's annoying yeah. <laughs> what was i gonna is there anything else we could cover or anything else you, um, you had you had a question about finding designers um or yes how, obviously personal recommendations go a long way um and putting a shout out on social media is a good way to get inundated by lots of varying quality of designers but yeah you we get some personal recommendations because one of the most important things i think again people tend to forget that part of the design process is this is the conversations is actually yeah. it's not just right i need this send an email the finished design comes back in there's, there's there's quite a lot more to the process and and having that communication and kind of discussing clients ideas is quite important so having someone you feel you can communicate with well um, and someone who will help you explore your own ideas but at the same time kind of try and form that brief with you the, the visual kind of brief because i think you mentioned obviously in the previous episode about the, the tone and the actual sort of me message and, and and kind of um, core focus of it and that obviously will inform the the visual brief quite a lot with a, with your designer you can then hopefully uh, refine that and explore different ways that could work and through the part of the process you might find that some of the ideas you both have at the start don't actually pan out but you've explored them or sometimes it's yeah it, it, there's a process to it and and it's it's uh and as long, I think one of the really nice things to do is stay involved as well, because I think some people really do want to just switch off and, and have it come back. And I think actually everyone being involved means there's no horrible surprises at the end. And then the designer presents something and goes, hope you like it. I'm not going to explain why it looks like this. <laughs> and I think that's a, that's also another thing to, to realize is that, you know, it, it's got to be an evolutionary process. It's not always mm. going to be. You know, as, you know, as a client, you don't always get exactly what you want the first time around. And as a designer, I guess you can't always fully get the, the picture the first time. So, you, you know, you have to sort of be prepared for to, to reiterate a bit. Definitely. No, it's, it's lovely when you do nail it first time, obviously. It's, it's definitely a trip because it's quite interesting. Because when you do your first initial concepts often, hopefully they're in definitely in the right area. If they're, if they're wildly off, that brings up two questions. One, has the designer completely lost, <laughs> lost the plot or is the brief at odds with the creative direction we're trying to go in? And, and mm. is that we need to kind of revisit and make sure the brief is 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 correct and actually kind of explore that and discuss that i think one of the other questions that um was was asked uh, was, was fired over earlier was uh, also um giving feedback to your designer yeah. um and i've definitely it's really interesting different countries are very very different um on how they give feedback I, uh, when, you, when you work when you've worked with people in uh, different countries in right okay in, in the uk we're very polite and very kind of like almost apologetic if anything's if anything's off or or really really blunt there's probably a nice middle way and, and working with american client they were very confused as to why i was apologizing for anything they were just like here's here's what we think go mm -hmm. ahead this is it and it was quite it was a very different kind of uh, approach but one of the things I, I would just say there is you know be be polite to a certain mm -hmm. degree but don't worry about telling your designer if something's not right for you because fundamentally yeah. 
it's not we are very used to receiving feedback of all different things obviously we love hearing good things yeah uh, we also are very used to hearing when something isn't right the thing that i'd say that's quite important is to try and think about why you do or don't like something is because i think that's something people aren't used to thinking about you just have a gut reaction it's like, oh, i don't like that it's like that's going to be really hard for a designer to mm. fix if you can say i don't like that it's too brash or it's too bold or oh, i don't like this or this reminds me of that try and kind of like flesh out kind of the issues so that the designer can address them either talking you through them if they really feel it's worth going for or just they know what to change and know what to shift so i think that's kind of an important part of that process so you know the other thing i was going to ask is how important do you think it is to have a design that you can actually meet with face to face i mean obviously at the moment we're doing video chat because things are a little bit different right now but um do you think you know having face-to-face -face meetings gives you a different level of connection with a client do you think that really helps you understand that person yeah i mean i think it, it definitely does i've definitely enjoyed doing that a lot more in the last couple of years um yeah. it's really helpful i think you get a sense i think people feel if things are just email to email, I think people can forget that the designer isn't a robot working in Photoshop or whatever. <laughs> and I think when you just speak and suddenly you're, you're two people both trying to make something that's right. Yeah. It's not about the designer doing something they really like. It's about making sure that it's appropriate and correct for, for, for that person. And obviously at the moment, yes, we can't meet up in person. So I definitely would say, you know, if you can't meet up in person, definitely get on the phone, definitely video. Uh, yeah. if, if it's something you're comfortable with, I think it, it does make a really big difference, especially for a personal brand. Mm. I think it's really important. Okay. Because yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking, because there's, there's a lot of people who will, um, you know, they'll use freelancing websites to, to find designers. And you, as you say, quite a lot of the time, traditionally, those, those kind of sites have been very much focused on messaging systems or email and therefore you might be you working with a designer on the other side of the world and there's nothing wrong with that but then if you never sort of meet them or never have that conversation with them i think it's quite you know it's you don't have that same dynamic and it's quite different when we're providing feedback so i think actually you know you make a really good point if you can't meet them face to face and if you can work with someone in a local area brilliant you want to support local designers etc as well um but if not you know definitely get on the phone make sure that they, they're happy to chat you on video i think you touched on it earlier there's a huge amount of psychology to mm. visual design it's you know that no one stops and thinks about typefaces and the way they make you feel <laughs> yeah. they make you feel i mean don't get me wrong i, I envy the person at, at uh, paint companies that comes up with all of the world's most floral descriptions for um 12 kinds of magnolia but, um, <laughs> uh, but the, 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 there is a lot of sense and emotion that connects to these things and, and and that varies actually around the world as well different colors mean different things to different societies and cultures mm. yeah, it's one of the pluses and minuses of working with people on the other side of the planet is just making sure you're actually on the same page about what's the appropriate color palette so um yeah there's a lot of different sort of elements and and just Hopefully it also makes it a bit less dry as well for the client. It's, you know, it should hopefully be sort of a fairly interesting experience if they've not worked with creators before. It should should be, they should be hopefully a bit switched on, a bit engaged yeah. with it and feel part of the process as well. I agree. Um, I think it, and it should be an exciting experience. Ultimately, personal brand, you know, it is something that's personal and it's something that other people are going to be engaging with. So, you know, you need to feel connected to it. And you should go. You should walk away feeling excited to go out and push it forward. I think if if you don't feel excited by the end of the process, the the, the process has not been right, right? or the the, the, the yeah. designer hasn't been right for you, or whatever. Completely. I think one of the things that I, I I definitely kind of pride myself on is kind of I like I like to give people stuff that's they're comfortable with, but also stuff mm. that um, pushes them or pushes you out of your comfort zone. Because ultimately, when you have a really interesting design, mm. the reason it's interesting is it causes a pretty visceral or a bit pretty strong reaction in someone. And the thing is, that means you might love it. That does mean someone else might absolutely can't stand it. So unfortunately, you sort of have to kind of, if you want something interesting, yeah, it'll annoy a few people. Because they'll not annoy them, but like they won't like it. It won't be for them. It's like, oh, you, yeah. You, I can't stand anything with pink in it. It's like, well, that's a shame. A and great example of that was when we were kind of cut crafting my personal design. And I remember I, I was like, well, going, I can't remember exactly what it was, but I said, oh, like, let's go for maybe yellow and black and, and this type of font. Yes. And I remember you turn up at the office with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of uh, like, 
um, flyers from like uh, you know uh, was it yeah. the art center or something you, yeah, you I, put them down in front of me said look this is, everyone's doing this at the moment this is not necessarily the best idea no. and, I, and actually that was great because that challenged me and thought you know you've got a really good point there <laughs> maybe we should move away from that idea and, and that's that's the thing i think you have to if you're working with a designer and they're willing to actually challenge you as a client for, for you know for a good reason it's not um the right yeah. way of going i never want to be the person who just tells you no and <laughs> Why? Exactly. Part of me likes the idea of, of, of you know, the, the old greats of graphic design would rock up to some massive boardroom, put down one logo and say, there you go, there's your graphic, <laughs> walk out. I mean, I envy, I envy that on some level, but I don't think it's very realistic <laughs> nowadays. But yeah, no, I think someone should, I think you shouldn't be afraid to challenge. And I think you should have a good relationship with your designer where yeah. you'll be willing to be challenged by them and they can yeah. feel they challenge you because ultimately, I think that the thing, oh, the next thing I was going to mention was, yeah, you, you know, if you have a strong design, it'll have a strong reaction. If you end up with something that everyone's all right about, it'll probably be very middle of the road, very acceptable, very mm. nice, but it might not get much attention. It might not stand out from the crowd if that's what you're trying to do. And sometimes that's really appropriate. Sometimes you might just want something that is just pleasantly correct. And for a corporate brand or for a branding job, you know, I'm not saying all accountants brands or anything, but for example, yeah. something slightly drier, you know, there's a time and a place to be, to not start shouting and screaming and have, yeah. having something that's really energetic. But, um, but yeah, for something personal, you want something that grabs you, I think. So, yeah. Cool. All right, Mark. Thanks very much. Uh, if people want to find out more about you, how can they get in touch? Uh, yeah. Um, my brand is a uh, studio squid dot code uk and um, you can find me on all social media as studio squid that's how you can find me and see some of my latest work and uh and see and see, see what i've just done with my own personal brand during lockdown <laughs> which um i went fairly all in on the colors so i've not know. seen this yet actually i'd love to check it out all right yeah no it's just gone up um so yeah, yeah. Um, hope you enjoy <laughs> All right, so part one, we looked at the concept. We've got a solid idea of exactly what we want to achieve and what goals we want to set for ourselves. In part two, we've talked all about our visual identity, actually how to bring these ideas to life. Because ultimately, when you're creating a personal brand online, everything is visual. Everything you do is visual, needs a visual element to it. So in part number three, we're going to be talking about how to implement your personal brand. You've got a good idea now of exactly what it is you want to achieve, what goals you want to set, and you've got a cool look and feel for your personal brand. But how do you actually go about rolling this out across different sort of channels. We're going to be looking at what sort of content you can produce, what sort of content will generate the most conversation between you and your audience, and just really look at exactly the platforms that are available to us as marketers or someone who's looking to grow their brand. 